let me share a little bit about myself for those who are first timers here with you. Uh, my name is Mara Walsh, as I said. I am in the United States and specifically in Yardley, Pennsylvania, which is between Philadelphia and New York. It is in the Eastern time zone. The reason I mentioned this is because when we post what time these virtual tours are, we always use Eastern time zone. So if you're using a converter, you can use New York or Philadelphia with your hometown and it will tell you what local time you should log in. Don't let the name Girl Travel Tours fool you. We welcome everyone on our physical tours and our virtual tours, not just girls. The name came about because I started leading physical tours as a Girl Scout leader, but now I lead tours for all ages. I lead tours from teens through senior citizens. I have adult only tours. I have multi-generational tours. If you're interested in joining a group of um, on tour with me, please let me know. And I will also review the tours that I have coming up after our presentation today. There's a couple of reasons why I started this virtual tour series. One, I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restrictions where they haven't been able to work. And I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my group and extend that opportunity to those of you who've learned about us through friends and family and on social media. I am so glad to have touched so many of you that may not be able to travel physically, but you travel with us nearly every week virtually. So welcome again. We've done about 60 tours since COVID struck in this format. If you'd like to access any of the recordings, they're all available on YouTube, on my website, and on my Facebook page, girltraveltours.com. There is a virtual drop-down menu and it will take you to all the tours that we've done in the last year and a half. And it will also give you a link to view it on YouTube if you'd like. We have several more tours planned for the coming year. I'm gonna share a slide that will show you the um, upcoming tours. We have Northern Spain next week, December 14th. Bethlehem um, is coming up on December 21st. And then we're gonna explore the Christmas markets of Europe on the 28th of December. We have just started to add our virtual tours for 2022. Right now, I have a few that are that you're able to register for. And these, again, are on Girl Travel Tours uh, in the virtual tour drop-down menu. We have George back with us, um, who's going to bring us Stonehenge and the Pagans in January on the 12th. We will see Austin again for a Scotch tasting tour. And we have Vlad back with us, who will take us to his capital city of Bucharest. Um, give me a little bit of time to publish those uh, while we're on this virtual tour so that you can sign up. I know that they're not live right now, but they will be live in about a half an hour. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, I will continue to produce them for you. And we have a slew of guides who are willing to come on and share their passion with travel and their, their hometowns and their regions with you as well. Um, I want to give a shout out to all those of you who have joined us from Facebook. I also want to give a warning for those of you who may have been asked to pay for access to this tour. Um, those, unfortunately, are requests from scammers. I do not ask people to pay to log into my tours. So if you did pay to access this, um, that was, was an illegal request. And you should uh, make sure that you report those people because they may be using your credit card information for other means. Um, of course, we do accept tips for the guides during the presentation, but that is a different type of um, financial exchange and certainly not, I do not ask for people to pay to log in. Okay, I want to review a few ways that you can interact with us during this event. Feel free to ask questions to the tour guide or to me through the Zoom Q&A link on the toolbar. Those questions are read off at the end of the presentation and we will deal with the answers to those live in front of the audience. If you want to send me a note, that should be through chat. Those are not live, but I will do my best to respond to those as we go through the presentation. And I do try to keep my eye on the Facebook um, feed so that I can um, interact with you all on Facebook at the same time. Okay, so as you well know, if you've been with me before, I love to put up a poll 
And this poll gives us an opportunity to understand what your connection is with the region. So I've just launched the poll and it is, what is your connection to Sicily? I've been in love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. I'll give you a second while people log into this. If you're on a device, sometimes it's hard to see the poll question pop up. So I apologize for that. And if you're on Facebook, obviously you don't see the poll, but feel free to log your answer in the chat or in the um, feed on Facebook. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. As we see, most people have um, responded and I'm gonna share these results with you. And it looks like um, we have about 43% of the people who've no set plans, but they're interested in the location. How could you not be interested in this location? That's what I wanna say. Of course, we're all interested in this location. Um, there is about 17% who've been, and, and there's a lot of people who plan to go in the future. I think we all plan to go to many places since we've been sitting at home for a good 18 months at this point. All right. If you need to take the poll off of your screen, there should be a X or a red dot or something. You can get it off your screen so that you can see the presentation again. Today's tour and all of our tours are scheduled for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So I hope you are ready with a snack or a drink in hand and you're sitting um, ready for a good tour. A tour wouldn't be complete without a fantastic tour director. And we are lucky today to have back Linda who recently shared her love for Venice with us. So if you did not see that virtual tour and you like what Linda brings to you today, you can go back and view it um, from my website. Um, but I know that you will, you will love her presentation. I'll share with you via chat and the Q&A how you can tip the tour guide. If you appreciate this presentation and her shared experiences, please um, use some of the means, it's, it's Venmo, PayPal, or I have a secure link to a um, credit card um, uh, feed on my website. So you can tip in any of those three manners. Um, so today, without uh, any more of my talk, I'm sorry to speak so long, but um, I'd like to welcome back Linda. Linda, if you're ready, you can join me and I will hand over this event to you and I'll, I'll mute myself so that we can get to the real content which everybody's come for, which is Sicily and your tour. Welcome, how are you doing, Linda? It's nice to see you again. Thank you, nice to see you again. Thank you very much for having me again. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that we can get started on this virtual adventure to Sicily. Um, Okay. Perfect. I hope you can all see my screen. Okay, here we are. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. It's a pleasure to take you virtually to one of my favorite destinations uh, in the Mediterranean. I call this tour Sicilian Kaleidoscope, and you will understand throughout the presentation why I did so. Sicily is a melting pot of cultures and uh, um, of uh, uh, a very rich heritage, and Kaleidoscope seemed to me like the appropriate word to use uh, for this amazing region. First of all, where is, uh, uh, it, where is Sicily located uh, on the map of Italy? Sicily is the island that is just off the toe of Italy. It is actually the largest Italian region and it is the fifth most populated region of this country. Uh, the population is about 4,800,000 inhabitants. And uh, as I said, it is the fifth uh, uh, most populated. Uh, altogether in Sicily, there are about 391 between towns, uh, small villages uh, and big cities. Uh, the bigger city is Palermo, which is the capital of the island. Uh, and the other two larger cities are Catania and uh, Messina. But now let's have a look about where Sicily is located in the Mediterranean Sea to explain, to start explaining its amazingly into intricate history. 
Uh, as you can see, Sicily is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, when I have to describe Sicily every single time I welcome my guests there, I always say that it's an island that borders uh, two worlds. It is actually as much North African as it is European. It is the largest island in the Mediterranean, and it is also the 45th most extended island in the world. It's a real gateway between East and West, and it has been so for centuries. And that's why the history of this place is so rich and its culture is incredibly diverse. Um, a lot of people have been invading and conquering Sicily, they're not all came in peace, but what they left on the island is the result of this very diverse culture. Now, when you look at this map, you understand that conquering Sicily was a matter of conquering the Mediterranean. Uh, if you controlled this island, you can definitely control the movement of trade and people throughout the Western and the Central Mediterranean. This uh, are the three element the, the, the three elements uh, of the flag of Sicily. First of all, Sicily has an official flag since January of two of the year 2000. And the three elements are two colors in this figure in the middle. The two colors are yellow and red. And the figure in the middle is quite strange. I'm going to take some time to describe it to you. First of all, let's start with the colors. Why do we have yellow and why do we have red? Yellow symbolizes Palermo and red symbolizes the town of Corleone. That was the first one, the first city who actually sided with Palermo in uh, um, pushing back the French Anjou domination in the 13th century here in, uh, in Sicily. And then let's come to the central element of this flag, which is the figure. We have three legs, we have the head of a woman, and then we have the wheat. Uh, the three legs symbolize the three promontories of Sicily. As you can see, the island is shaped as a triangle. The three capes, the three promontories are symbolized by the three legs. The head is that of Medusa. And Medusa is also a symbol of protection. Uh, and instead of having the snakes on the head of Medusa, as it is in the Greek mythology, we actually have the wheat. This happened during the Roman times. It was, it, they, the Romans were the ones who substituted the, the, the snakes with the wheat to symbolize what Sicily was for them. For the Romans, Sicily was the granary of the Roman Empire. So that is why this figure was changed this way. Now, let's have a look at our journey through Sicily. Uh, Sicily is a very large region, as I said, uh, and it is impossible to cover everything in one single virtual tour. Therefore, I have chosen some locations uh, and I have chosen some historical periods in order to show you as much as I could about this amazing region. Uh, we go from uh, east to west and we're going to zigzag also in the middle of Sicily today. Uh, our journey cannot be comprehensive of every single thing that Sicily has to offer to travelers who come here every year from all around the world. It is also one of the regions of Italy that has an incredible amount of UNESCO protected sites. So that gives you a sense of the importance of this region in the history. Where would I like to start? I would like to start from the oldest thing there is on the island, a volcano, Mount Etna. Mount Etna is uh, the perfect way to start narrating Sicily and to trace back the history and the, ma and the main cultural features uh, of this island. Uh, the island character to me was given, was born in Greek myth and, uh, and, and in the shade of Mount Etna, Europe's largest volcano. This one eye, this one eyed giant, uh, this cyclop, uh, was for the Greeks the home of a monster, Typhon, a hundred snaked head, head who battled against Zeus to be the champion of the cosmos. Uh, 
When Zeus won, he suppo supposedly, supposedly imprisoned this monster here underneath Mount Etna, burying him uh, underneath the mountain. Now, let's have a look at Mount Etna today. It is still one of the most famous landmarks of Sicily. Uh, the Sicilians refer to it as Mamma Etna. Yes, it's a she and she is a mother. The people who live on the eastern side of Sicily, they do consider Mount Etna a little bit like a neighbor. Yes, sometimes it does give troubles, but it still is a blessing for this territory. Let's have a look at the next slide. You can see the new elevation. I wrote new elevation because there is a curiosity about the elevation of Mount Etna. In feet nowadays, it is 11,013 feet and in meters it is 3,357 meters. This volcano, which is the highest in Europe, has been rated to have reached its maximum elevation in August of 2020 Yes, so recently. Why is that? Because in August 2021, the National Institute for Geophysics and Volcanology of the city of Catania reported that a series of eruptions of 50 small eruptions that took place in early 2021 added about 100 feet to the former elevation of Mount Etna. In this, in, right now, Mount Etna has reached the, the highest elevation ever. Mount Etna consists of uh, two parts, uh, let's say like two distinct volcanoes. Uh, one is uh, uh, an older volcano and it's, it's called a shield volcano. And the other one is a younger volcano and it's called a strato volcano. The Sicilians refer to it as the Mongibello. Now to give you an idea about the age, you need to understand, you need to know that uh, the shield volcano started erupting about 500 100,000 years ago, while the volcano, the younger volcano, the strato volcano, started its activity 35,000 years ago. And that's the reason why I wanted to start with the oldest site that we have in Sicily. The very first eruptions of Mount Etna have been documented since 1,500 before Christ. The volcano has experienced uh, an incredible amount of eruptions since then. And uh, in 1669, the lava flow reached uh, all the way down to the city of Catania, which is pretty far away. Well, in reality, what happened was that uh, during this eruption, the summit uh, collapsed and the lava managed to flow through a crack uh, to, uh, through the volcano's flank and reached the sea and the town of Catania. Of course, the inhabitants of Catania tried their best to, to prevent their homes from being destroyed. And one of the things they tried to do was the first attempt of controlling the path of the flowing lava. Uh, they didn't succeed, but this was a first try in the history of the many eruptions of Mount Etna. Many attempts have been made, sometimes successfully diverting the lava Lava flow and saving some of the communities around Mount Etna. You need to understand one thing. It has been estimated that about 25% of Sicily population lives around the slope of Mount Etna. So it is an extremely quite populated area. Now, Let's go to the next slide and let's start with the very first people who came to Sicily. We started this presentation by saying that Sicily was appealing to many and many came here, many conquered, many invaded and all of them left a mark on this culture. The very first ones were the Greeks. 
and it all, sta it all started in what nowadays is called the Bay of Naxos. Nowadays, the town that you see here in this beautiful bay is called Giardini Naxos. And Giardini Naxos corresponds to the area where the first settlers from Greece arrived here in Italy and precisely here in, in Sicily. This happened around 735 before Christ. They landed in this wonderful natural harbor. Uh, their arrival was part uh, of a greater Greek operation of expansion in the Mediterranean world. And they created what later became to be known as Magna Grecia. Magna Grecia was greater Greece. The destiny of Sicily had changed forever. The first Greeks who landed here were followed by other communities, other Greek groups who spread and settled all around the eastern and the southern coast of the island. It was not really an organized colonization. It was mostly like the arrival of individual groups, all doing things on their own in their own way, settling, conquering, and making Sicily Greek. Nowadays, there is not much left of uh, the Greek uh, um, architecture here in Naxos. In reality, I'm showing you two very modern monuments. We know from, hist from historians that the first settlers who arrived here at Giardini Naxos, they built an altar as soon as they safely settled here. And this altar must have been dedicated to Apollo the founder. Today, as I said, there is not much left. In these two pictures, these two modern monuments built in ancient style, one of them, the one on the left-hand side, carries the name of Naxos in Greek alphabet, while the one, the lower one on the right-hand side of your screen, is a monument that was built in 1960. In 1960, something special happened here in Italy. Uh, Italy, for the first and only time, hosted the Olympic Games. They were actually held in Rome. And symbolically, this Olympian temple was built in Naxos, the first Greek colony of Italy. And uh, an, Olympi an Olympian flame was lit up here in this temple. It was a sort of ideal connection between the new capital that was hosting the Games, also home to the ancient Roman Empire, Empire and the land where the Greeks arrived way before the Romans conquered. So this ideal connection was established with the construction of this little temple. Now, what is this area famous for nowadays? Uh, at, uh, Naxos is uh, in the bay, but up on the top of the hill, there is one of the most well-known tourist destinations uh, of Sicily, the little town of Taormina. Taormina is a beautiful tourist destination, an elegant little town filled with beautiful hotels, uh, with restaurants, lots of shops, and incredible views of the surroundings. Things. I mean, this picture was taken from the top of Taormina. You can see Mount Etna in the distance, almost uh, partially covered by clouds, and you can definitely see the beauty of the Ionian coast. We are in the Mediterranean, but on the eastern side of Sicily, we are on the Ionian Sea. And uh, a German writer, Goethe, who traveled to Italy, called, nicknamed Taormina, the Pearl of the Ionian Sea. Here in Taormina, there is an amazing ancient site that from this picture, you can enjoy uh, the view from high above. This is the ancient theater of Taormina. Uh, it is an ancient Greek theater that was built around the third century BC. Under Roman rule, the theater was rebuilt and it was uh, changed, probably around the time of Emperor Hadrian or Trajan. It was remodeled in the third century AD with uh, the orchestra turned uh, into an arena and the stage uh, being removed. Uh, 
the theater could house 10, 000, can, could accommodate 10,000 spectators and it is still in use nowadays for the summer festival, an annual venue that is called Taormina Arte. It is dug directly into the hard rock of the mountain and the mountain here is called Monte Tauro. Uh, it is known that the Greeks uh, used uh, the Greeks, the Greek Arctic architects used to build their most important important uh, buildings uh, as if nature could be part of it. Uh, and look at the scenery that you could if, imagine yourself sitting into the sitting area of this theater. You can definitely understand what Goethe, again, the German writer, said about this place. There is no other place in the world where the audience can enjoy such a fine view. And it is absolutely true. Now, this picture was taken by me later uh, the, last summer, and uh, it does show uh, the, the, the spectators uh, sitting uh, in the main sitting area. The theater this year was not completely used for COVID reasons, so the capacity was reduced to a minimum, but it gives you a sense of what the stage looks like when you're actually sitting in there. It is one of a kind experience to be actually sitting there there, listening to good music or a great theater play or many other types of show that are held here in Taormina. Taormina is also a very, um, a, a very prestigious destination for the, for the Italian summers. Now, let's move on. We're still on the eastern coast of Sicily, but we're moving towards the city of Syracuse or Syracuse in Italian. Uh, this is, uh, believe it or not, this little piece of land uh, into the sea is actually an island and it is also the oldest part of Syracuse, that is the, the historical center of Syracuse, the very heart of the city. Syracuse was uh, the Greek capital of Sicily, founded 27 centuries ago. 734 BC is when the Corinthians founded what later became one of the richest and most powerful cities on the island and in the entire Greek world. Now, let me show you this map so that I can give you a sense of what the modern city of Syracuse is like. With my mouse, I'm moving around so that you can, tr you can try to understand what I'm talking about. In this area, we have the ancient excavations that I will show you in a moment. This instead is the modern city of Syracuse, and this one divided by the modern, from the modern city by a bridge is the island of Ortigia that I was describing before. I'm going to start by talking about the cathedral of Syracuse. And I'm gonna explain you in a moment why I wanna do so. This monument is incredibly special to explain the intricate and diversity of the history of, uh, of Sicily. Um, the southeastern part of Sicily is also known for, uh, for its Baroque architecture. Baroque is a style that here in Sicily found an incredible place to evolve into what later on was defined as Sicilian Baroque. And when you actually look at the Cathedral of Syracuse, you see a Christian church in perfect Baroque style. It is located in the heart of Ortigia, the island that was talking about and uh, it is uh, a building that has uh, that actually hides uh, many secrets it is today a christian church but in reality once you walk through its doors uh, it's like taking a trip back in time here we are inside the cathedral of Syracuse. This trip back in time goes started 500 years before the birth of Christ. The cathedral began its life in 480 BC. 
as the project of a Greek tyrant who had beaten the Carthaginians, another population who ruled over the western side of the island, who dominated the western side of the island, in a battle, a battle called the Battle of Himera. During this, the, the Battle of Himera was a crucial moment in the history of Greek Sicily. The future of Sicily was hung in the balance. This incredible victory needed to be celebrated, and the way of celebrating it was with the construction of a great temple. A temple in the ancient world is not only a religious symbol, but it's also a sign of power. So no surprise that the choice was that of building a temple. The temple was going to be dedicated to Athena and the building started to be admired by all those who came after the Greeks. The Romans, for example, um, admired this place. Now look at it. You perfectly see, see still to now to this day, the columns of the ancient temple of Athena. This ancient temple was topped with a statue of the goddess with a gold shield, a statue that must have been incredible, a statue that could be seen miles away from this location. This was a place that was built built to impress. And if you consider, if you think that this place was built even before the construction of the Parthenon in Athens, then it's really mind blowing. Now, when the Romans invaded Sicily, of course, they admired this place. And like all the others who came after them, they made changes to this place. To this place. But the story did not stop with the Romans. In reality, this place went through an incredible series of events. When the Roman Empire collapsed, the, Byzantine, the Byzantines came. They broke through the inner walls of this temple and they filled they filled in the outer colonnade in order to create a Christian church. You would say, okay, now the story stops right here. No. In reality, Sicily, after the Byzantines, was going to become Arab. And when the Arabs invaded Sicily, then the citizens of Syracuse took refuge here and they were massacred before the Arab conquest turned this church into a mosque. The story continues because after the Arabs came the Normans and the church and, and the mosque went back into being a church. They built a roof that was higher than the original one. And we can say that generation after generation, everyone who came to Sicily added to this building their particular touch. By standing here, you stand in the middle of two and a half thousand years of Sicily kaleidoscopic heritage and history. And that's why I decided to call this adventure a kaleidoscopic adventure to the heart of the Mediterranean. In Syracuse, we also have uh, an incredible uh, amount of ancient sites. Uh, in the area that I showed you before on the map, just off the modern city, there is the ancient excavation, the archeological park of Syracuse. And here is the location of the Syracuse Greek Theater. The, the Syracuse Greek Theater is one of the most uh, uh, famous monuments uh, in the city. Uh, and also in the antiquity, this was uh, of international fame. Um, uh, it is the very high example of civil architecture in the ancient time. This was a place uh, of worship and of large popular assemblies, a site of public trials. And in the Roman times, it also became, was transformed in a circus. It was almost forgotten 
in the Middle Ages and in the following centuries. And the theater became an object of transformation, robberies, damages, removals. Today, what we see is definitely far from the original uh, theater that once existed in this place. Have a look at the theater. In the previous picture, there were there was uh, there, there were there were stage settings uh, because every every year here we have uh, some theater events. Uh, uh, now the theater of Syracuse is a very active theater still to this day. Why is that? Because in Italy we do have uh, this foundation INDA I N D A. In Italian, this is uh, the National Institute of Ancient Drama. Institute Nazionale del Dramma Antico. I'm not afraid to say that this is one of a kind institution all over the world. Look at the picture on the left hand side. It is the advertisement of one of the plays at the Theatre of Siracusa between the 16th and the 19th of April 1914, because it is in 1914 that this institute started its activity and the activity is that of taking care of the classical culture and every year in the theater of Syracuse we have plays we have a festival of ancient theater and the stage is set up to welcome spectators now all the pictures that I'm using are from the past in the past they used to build great magnificent scenery and they give you a they give you a great idea of what uh, the experience is like to be sitting in this theater still to this day at the end of spring, beginning of summer, and watch one of the ancient tragedies. In this ancient park, archaeological park, there is also an incredible place that is called the Ear of Dionysus. Now, this is a mix of legend and reality. It is a very beautiful place. Now, the abandoned fascination of this place nowadays uh, uh, hardly uh, gives us uh, the sense uh, of what, uh, at, what, what tragic events uh, actually took place here. Let me just uh, give you a little uh, historical insight. In 415 before Christ, uh, Sicily and Syracuse uh, had become the major front of the Peloponnesian Wars, the civil war that was tearing the Greek world apart. The Athenian fleet sailed into the harbor of Syracuse and tried to take the city. It was a disaster. It all lasted for two years until the Syracuse people defeated the Athenians who ran away and those who managed to escape were captured and ended up working in the quarries of Syracuse. This is what you have in front of you now. It's a quarry. Why is it called the Ear of Dionysus? You would think because of the shape. Yes, it is because of the shape. This man-made cave is in the shape of the ear, but in reality, the name was given by the man on the right-hand side of the screen. That man is called Caravaggio and is one of the most important Italian painters of the 1600s. Caravaggio was a very, very particular man. He was a genius. Uh, uh, it, it was a, as an artist, he was a genius. As a man, he was uh, uh, very often in troubles. And uh, in Rome, he had killed men. That's why at the time when he was in Syracuse, around 1609, he actually was on the run. He escaped from Rome because otherwise he would be executed for having killed a man. He had gone to Malta and escaped from Malta. And that's when he came here to Syracuse. Now, 
When he arrived here, he took a chance to visit the ancient sites of uh, uh, this beautiful city. And when he arrived at the quarries, and specifically in this place, he made up the story of the tyrant, ancient tyrant Dionysius, who actually uh, captured kept the captives that he had captured into this cave and he stood on the top of the cave listening to them desperately lamenting them downstairs and carefully listening if any of them was plotting against him and planning to escape this place. Now, the reason behind this is because Caravaggio noticed right away the perfect acoustics of this man-made cave. But the story is totally made up. It's a legend. There was no that the tyrant existed, but it didn't stand on the top of that hill listening to uh, the, the to the um, to the captives inside the cave. Caravaggio in Siracusa also left uh, his uh, mark. Uh, if Siracusa is a place uh, that has been invaded, conquered uh, by, many by many different uh, uh, populations, it's true that also in more recent times, like the times of Caravaggio, uh, artists and intellectuals uh, left their mark on the culture of the place. This is the painting that Caravaggio made for Siracusa. Caravaggio is known all around the world as the great master of light and shade. This contrast that makes his paintings extremely dramatic and realistic. This is the burial of Saint Lucy. And uh, when it was painted, it was painted to go into the church of Santa Lucia al Sepolcro, which is the place where Saint Lucy, patron saint of Siracusa, was actually killed. Who was Saint Lucy? Uh, Lucy had uh, given away all her wealth to the poor in the ancient times uh, in gratitude because of a miracle she had received, uh, the healing of her mother. She was denounced as a Christian. Those were the Roman times uh, and it was a crime to be a Christian. And she was denounced by, by her own suitor and uh, who wrongly suspected her to have been uh, to, for infidelity. Uh, she refused to recant and offered her chastity to Christ and was then sentenced to be dragged in a brothel. But a miracle happened. Nothing could move her or displace her from where she was, from the spot where she stood. She was then pierced by a knife in her throat and where she fell, the church of St. Lucy in Syracuse was built. Now, having left uh, um, Siracusa, we're going to move to another amazing destination in Sicily, overlooking the African Sea. At this point, it is that body of water that separates uh, uh, Sicily from Africa. And the town is nowadays called Agrigento. But in the ancient times, this was Akrakas. It was another Greek colony. It was founded uh, by the Greeks who had already settled in another part of eastern Sicily, in a town called Gela, together with other Greeks coming from Crete and from Rhodes. The years, the time when this happened is around 582, 580 before Christ. Ancient Akrakas covers a huge area. And this area is called the Valley of the Temples, which is the most distinctive part of this incredible ancient city, which is mostly still underground, being excavated. The Valley of the Temple is the historical sacred area of, uh, um, of this uh, Greek site. And what you're looking at is the so-called Temple of Concordia. 
The Valley of the Temple is a world heritage site. It is one of the most important UNESCO sites of Italy. And the reason for its importance is because all the temples that we find here are the best preserved Doric, Doric temples constructed. Now, this temple, the Temple of Concordia, takes its name after a Latin inscription. So an inscription dating back to the Roman times when Acracas became Agrigentum, from where we have the modern day name of the city. Concordia is the name that was assigned to it because of the presence of this inscription that was, find ne that was found nearby this temple. Look at the modern city of Agrigento. It is up on the top of the hill. It is in clear contrast with the ancient sites. The modern city of Agrigento is a mix of modern with some uh, beautiful old churches, but mostly a modern city overlooking the ancient site known today as the Valley of the Temple. This giant that you see laying down on the floor, this was uh, uh, part of the temple of Olympian Zeus that was built in 480 before Christ to celebrate the city-state's victory against Carthage. And it was characterized by the use of these large-scale atlases, these columns shaped like giants. Now, the, uh, the original one is in the museum. The one you see here is actually a copy. Another temple. This time we're talking about the temple of Hira or Juno. The temple of Juno was built in the fifth century BC and it was burned, completely burned in the year 406 before Christ by the Carthaginians invading from the Western side of Sicily. And the last temple I'm going to show you of the Valley of the Temples is actually the Temple of Heracles. This was the most venerated deity in the ancient Acragas. It is the most ancient temple of the valley. It was destroyed by an earthquake. And nowadays, what you see still standing is only these eight columns surrounded by this lush vegetation, because another experience about uh, walking through the Valley of the Temples uh, is the rich the Sicilian vegetation that surrounds you. Here it's particularly fantastic when the almond trees uh, are in full blossom. I have talked a lot about the Carthaginians. I have mentioned them a lot. So it is time to cross over to the Western side of Sicily and to go clarify who the Carthaginians were. Uh, here we are in the area that is called the Stagnone Lagoon. We are in the province of Trapani. You can see here the symbol of the airport of Trapani. Trapani is one of the Sicilian uh, provincial capitals, uh, not too far from Palermo. This area is an actual lagoon, which means that here you're looking at shallow waters, a naturally protected area, protected by this uh, Isola Grande, which is the great island, which is a natural reserve. Now, in the middle of this lagoon, there is the little island of Mozia. Uh, the island, uh, the foundation of the city, probably dates back uh, to the 8th century before Christ. Um, and uh, in reality, uh, this place uh, was the place where the Phoenicians settled. The Phoenicians were an ancient population. They came from what nowadays is Syria and Lebanon, and they settled in the western part of Sicily. And they established exactly here on the tiny, tiny island of Mozia a trading uh, base. The little island in the middle of this shallow lagoon became an extremely powerful place. 
it's a very well organized place. Nowadays, it's a little bit of a garden for archaeologists who are continuously digging to find out more about this ancient population. The Phoenicians were eventually the end, they, they, they eventually saw the end of the independence of the island of Mozia uh, at the hands of one of their colonies, the Carthage, which the Carthaginians came from modern day Tunisia. Uh, the Phoenicians uh, had uh, transformed and fortified the island of Mozia, and uh, uh, initially this was a very inhospitable island uh, in the middle of this lagoon. Uh, but the, 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 the Phoenicians uh, and later the Carthaginians uh, uh, managed to, to make this become uh, a wonderful place. Well, there is uh, something that was found here in Mozia, and it's this beautiful piece of art. This is called the Mozia Charioteer. Um, in reality, this sculpture was found uh, in 1979, and it is now nowadays on display in the local museum. It is a very rare example of the victor of a chariot race who must have been very wealthy in order to commission such a work. Uh, it was found uh, built into the Phoenician fortifications uh, that were erected uh, on the island of Mozia at the time when the uh, Dionysus I of Sy Syracuse uh, invaded and sacked the island of Mozia in 397 BC. Its superb quality implies that this was made by a leading Greek artist. And most probably, it is believed that it must have been looted from a Greek city conquered by Carthage around 409 before Christ. But there is something else that the Phoenicians established here in this beautiful part of Sicily and that we still do nowadays, and a heritage that we are still carrying on to this day, and it is the harvest of sea salt. Salt is a very precious element since the ancient times. That's why the word salary derives from salt, actually. Um, it was uh, a way to pay in the ancient world. It was used uh, for leather making. It was used to preserve food. Uh, the extraction and the processing of salt uh, is uh, something that we inherited from the ancient people with ingenious and ingenious technological process that dates back to thousands of years ago. What you see in front of you now are the salt pans of the Stagnone area of the province of Trapani. The whole province of Trapani, the coastline, has this amazing salt pans, a legacy that we, the, 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 from the Phoenicians that we kept alive in modern day Sicily. This one is another salt pan, this time right by the city of Trapani. The salt is harvested, is processed here and it's shipped all over Italy. Um, a curiosity, Italians mostly use sea salt and I know that it lacks in iodine and that's why iodine is actually added to our salt. But in Italy, the majority of the salt consumed is from the sea. Now, we have talked about the most ancient populations. We have talked about uh, the Greeks, we have discussed about the Phoenicians and later the Carthaginians, but what happened later on the island of Sicily? Uh, the island of Sicily was eventually conquered by the Romans and the Romans changed Sicily forever. They changed everything. Sicily was Rome, first foreign conquest. After defeating first Syracuse and then the Carthaginians, the Romans Romanized Sicily and they turned it into the granary of the Roman Empire, changing the landscape of the island, creating incredible systems of grain production known as 
Latifundia. One of the centers was at Piazza Armerina, which you see written here on this slide. And here at Piazza Armerina, in the very heart of Sicily, uh, we have excavated an enormous villa, Villa Romana del Casale, built in the fourth century AD that gives you a sense of what a rustic villa back in the ancient Roman times was like. What was like to have in ancient Rome this very well organized communities where massive production of grain was carried out in order to supply the rest of the, the in order to supply Rome actually. The villa is extremely well preserved. When it was discovered, it had been hidden by a, mud, a mudslide, and that eventually preserved the structures. Well, of course, not the raised structures and not the roofs, but the inner decorations. The structures were then covered with uh, uh, plastic rooftops uh, in order to protect the amazing artwork that, that was discovered there. And just recently, we have uh, eliminated these plastic rooftops uh, because in reality, instead of being to the advantage of the preservation of this site, that became the reason why the site was being damaged year after year. So. In the last few years, uh, a huge work of restoration has been carried out uh, on the site of Piazza Armerina, once again, a UNESCO protected uh, listed world site. And uh, the restorations were also possible thanks to the pandemic. Uh, I mean, sometimes the pandemic has been a good thing, especially for archeologists. Uh, what did we discover here at Piazza Armerina? Here at Piazza Armerina, in the very heart of Sicily, we discovered that the villa was decorated with some of the finest Roman mosaics ever discovered before. These mosaics give an insight of what life was in Sicily uh, during the Roman times. But what is mostly interesting are the techniques and the craftsmen who worked, who worked here at Piazza Armerina, the techniques they used. Um, this incredible uh, craftsmen most probably came from Northern Africa. We can clearly understand by looking at the mosaics of Piazza Merina that there, they, there are two schools. Uh, one that is more traditional, more similar to all the other mosaics uh, that have been discovered even in the city of Rome. And another one that is uh, uh, more new, that is newer. It seems to be more interested in movement, in light in shade, like you can see on this mosaic. This mosaic is nicknamed uh, the ladies with the bikini. In reality, what you are looking at is a sports competition. And here you can see the girl who actually won and she's been crowned and carries the palm of the victory. Here you have another detail that gives you a sense, uh, a really a sense of uh, the uh, uh, of the anatomy that was being created with these tiny tiles on the floors of Piazza Armerina. But when you look at all the other mosaics, you really understand that one of the most important things we are taught from the mosaics of Piazza Armerina is the life that happened here. In the, in the on the island in the Roman times. Uh, there are a lot of animals uh, depicted on, uh, on these floors. Uh, each one of them tells us a story, but the overall picture we get at the end of this story is uh, how important Sicily was to the Romans, uh, what a crossroad Sicily was in the Roman world. Uh, I told you at the very beginning, sh Sicily stands in the middle between the African world and Europe, uh, and everything that was 
coming from Northern Africa was passing through Sicily. And by looking at these mosaics, we really get a sense of what goods uh, and what the Romans shipped back to Rome. Look at animals being carried on these vessels. And if you look at the next one, you can clearly see the detail of this elephant that is being carried on this ship that is going to sail, most probably to go to Rome. And surrounding the elephant, you see other animals. So it is easy to imagine that probably these animals were going to go to the Colosseum in Rome. It is probably the transportation of those exotic animals that entertained the Romans during the spectacles that were held at the arena of the Colosseum. There is another thing that needs to be said about uh, the ancient Roman conquest of, city, of, of Sicily. Rome took much more from Sicily than it, it actually gave. You know, when we think of the Romans, uh, we normally talk about uh, the cities uh, that were founded, uh, the roads that were built across the Roman Empire and all the conquered lands, uh, but nothing like that was done here in Sicily. The Romans actually took more than they left behind. Forests were totally erased from Sicily in order to make room for the grain production to build what passed to the history as the granary of the Roman Empire. And now, since we have traveled to the West already, we have to go to the most important city of Sicily, the capital, Palermo. In order to make a connection between the fall of Rome and uh, the most important moment in the history of Palermo, which is the Arab Norman time, uh, I have to tell you what happened after the fall of Rome. After the fall of Rome, Sicily was invaded by barbarian tribes. Uh, we had tribes coming from North Africa, and then we had tribes coming from uh, Northern Europe. Uh, when Europe, Europe moved uh, into the Middle Ages, uh, Sicily was captured by the Byzantines. Uh, they came from the East, from the Eastern Roman Empire. They were Christians and they spoke Greek and shared a lot in common with the Sicilian culture. But during the, the, the conquest of the Byzantines, another population was already coming towards Sicily. And these were the Arabs. They arrived in Sicily in the ninth century and they gradually occupied the island. Palermo became the new capital, but the, the, the Arab domination of Sicily was stopped by a later invasion that came from the north. In 1060, the Normans invaded Sicily. Sicily, under the Norman rule, became a model a model for all of Europe, admired all throughout Europe and Arabia. Norman Sicily stood forth in Europe uh, and uh, in, the, in the whole medieval world as an example of tolerance, of enlightened attitude, a lesson for the world in the respect that every man should receive. Uh, the, every man, despite of the blood, the belief, the differences, everyone should be respected the same way. Here in front of you, you have a castle located in Palermo. It is called Sisa Castle, and it is obviously uh, a very Arab Moorish flavor in its construction. Most probably the, craftsmen's, uh, the craftsmen who worked here were Arabian, and the construction began in 1165 under the rule of the Norman king, William I of Sicily. But it was not finished until 1189 under William II of Sicily. Now, the Ziza is inspired by Moorish architecture and the name Ziza itself comes from Arabic language. It is Al-Azish, which means deer or spirit 
splendid. When we think of the Arab Norman heritage, which is so much distinctive of the heritage of the culture of Palermo, we're talking about one single historical period because this transition between the Arab conquest of Sicily and the Norman conquest of Sicily and the cohabitation of these cultures together with the Byzantine culture within the same historical period has given this extreme diversity to the city of Palermo. Let's have a look at another uh, building. This one is the Royal Palace of Palermo. It is called the Norman Palace because this was the Royal Palace of the kings of Sicily, the Hauteville dynasty that came from Normandy. And it served even after the end of the Norman rule of Sicily as the seat of power for all the other rulers that came to Sicily. And in 1946, this place became the seat of the regional parliament of Sicily, of Sicily the place where the government of Sicily sits. Um, the Sicilian Regional Assembly. Uh, the building is also, cur curiosity, the building is uh, the uh, oldest royal residence in Europe. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, as I said, the private residence of uh, the Kingdom of Sicily and the imperial uh, seat of uh, important people such as Frederick II, but we're gonna talk about him in a moment. Uh, what there is inside this palace is an incredible place. This picture does not give justice to the beauty of this place. It is very hard to portray the beauty of this place in one picture. Uh, this is the Palatine Chapel or the Royal Chapel of the Norman Palace of Palermo. The building is an incredible mix of Byzantine, of Norman, of Moorish architectural styles showing this three culture, three cultures that lived together in Sicily during the 12th century Norman rule of the island. It was started, the construction was started by Roger II. It was consecrated in the year 1140. And the chapel is, of course, another of the many UNESCO's World Heritage listed sites of Sicily. The mosaics of the Palatine Chapel are uh, they have no equal in the world for their elegance, especially when it comes to the proportions, the draperies, the figures. They're also uh, incredible for the colors and for the light of these mosaics. Uh, probably the, 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 the mosaics uh, uh, are in, in the Palatine Chapel, they really give you a sense of what of that specific art of the Byzantines in depicting profane subjects because they are especially great in the depiction, in the representation of animals and plants. Now, when you are inside this chapel, everything is covered by these tiny little tiles. Everything is covered by mosaics, the walls, the arches, the dome, the presbytery, every single inch of this chapel. Uh, the other thing that is incredible in this chapel is the ceiling. Now I'm going to activate this video so that you really get a sense. This is, of course, is not the best quality. It was done uh, with uh, the cell phone, uh, but it gives you a sense of the space that I'm talking about. And it gives you really the idea of how how every single inch of this chapel was covered with this incredible mosaic work. In a moment, we're going to move towards the ceiling. And the ceiling, the wooden ceiling of the Palatine Chapel is the most evident testimony of the Islamic presence at the court of Roger in Sicily. But the marbles of Sicily and uh, of Palermo are not over. We're traveling just, uh, um, just outside of the city of Palermo to a little town called Monreale. On the other side, uh, 
of, uh, uh, of a valley. Uh, in this town, there is the famous Duomo di Monreale, the Cathedral of Monreale. This is considered to be one of the best churches in the whole world. It was built between 1170 and 1189. Once again, a UNESCO world listed site. The Cathedral of Monreale is regarded as the most beautiful of all the Norman churches of Sicily. Uh, the mosaics here uh, are incredible. Here there is, uh, it has been estimated that we have about 2,200 kilograms of pure gold employed in the making of this work. Here we have expert craftsmen who came from Constantinople, nowadays Istanbul, and they were employed to make this work. The Byzantine mosaics that you see in Monreale are among the most magnificent all over the world. Monreale is uh, overlooking the valley called the Concadoro, which means the golden shell. And it's uh, just inland from Palermo. Uh, the town grew around a Benedictine monastery. Uh, of that Benedictine mo monastery, there is not much left. Uh, nowadays, uh, is one of the richest and most beautiful uh, churches of Italy uh, that combines the Norman, the Byzantine style, the Italian style, and the Saracen style. Um, it was created in less than 10 years, and it's incredible uh, when you are there, because literally every single inch of this incredibly large church is covered by mosaics. I'm going to show you a detail. This is the detail of the Pantocrator Christ. What is the Pantocrator Christ? Christ Pantocrator is a specific depiction of Christ, usually translated as almighty, all powerful. Uh, and it is derived from one of the many names of God in Judaism. The Pantocrator uh, is largely known in the Eastern Orthodox and in the Eastern Catholic theological conceptions. Uh, it's less common uh, under the name, it's less common in, uh, in the Western Catholicism in reality. Um, and it's almost uh, largely unknown to the Protestant churches. Uh, in, the, in the West, the equivalent to this type of iconography would be uh, Christ in majesty, uh, which uh, in reality developed in a different, in a slightly different iconography. The Christ Pantocrator has come to suggest uh, Christ as a, a mild but stern, all-powerful judge of humanity. Now we're moving back to the city of Palermo and we are standing right outside the cathedral, the cathedral of Palermo. Uh, this has been a Byzantine church, it has been an Islamic mosque and finally a cathedral. Here lies the confluence of those cultures that all defined the history of Sicily. It was erected in 1185 and inside this cathedral, we actually have the royal tombs. Now, I promised before that I was to, going to talk about Frederick II. I'm a big fan of Frederick II. Uh, Frederick II uh, should not be regarded as one of the Norman kings of Sicily because in reality he was a Swabian, but he was the son of the last Norman of Sicily. And when he talked about himself, he always talked about a Norman from Sicily. Uh, here in this church, in the Cathedral of Palermo, we have the tombs of Harry VI, who was the father of uh, Frederick II. Uh, we have the tomb of his wife, Constance of Aragon. We have the tomb of Roger II of Sicily, of the mother of Frederick II, Constance. Uh, Frederick II uh, was uh, king of Sicily in 1198. He was king of Germany. He was king of Italy and Holy Roman Emperor 
and he was also king of Jerusalem. He was the son of Emperor Harry VI from Germany, and he was and an of Constance of Sicily from the Oatville dynasty. His political and cultural ambitions were enormous, and he ruled a very vast area, beginning with Sicily and stretching through Italy all the way north to Germany. I like to say that under Frederick II, the sense of of Europe being united under one power was about to be born. But Frederick was also a fine intellectual. Frederick, who is represented in this ancient book, was a man who spoke six languages. He was a, a patron of science and of arts, and he played a major role in pro pro promoting literature through the creation of the Sicilian school of poetry. Now, all those who have a passion for Italy know that the birth of modern Italian language is, uh, is actually granted to Dante Alighieri and to the Florentine language. But the very first literary production of what should be considered uh, the first attempt of modern Italian language happened in Sicily under Frederick II with the Sicilian school of poetry. All these qualities of this man gained him the nickname of Stupor Mundi, the wonder of the world. Now, we have seen a lot of uh, different cities and archaeological sites, uh, but now we need to talk about what this diversity in history and culture has done to the customs of the Sicilians. For example, let's go back to the Arab influence. The Arab influence is clearly to be is clearly, clearly found in the Sicilian cuisine. In this picture, we have a jello, a dessert, that is mostly served in Palermo, that is made with watermelon. On the top, you see pistachio nuts. In reality, both these elements, watermelons and pistachio nuts, were introduced in Sicily by the Arabs. The Arabs have done an incredible number of things. Uh, a lot of the things that we give for granted nowadays were actually introduced into the Western culture by the Arabs. They introduced, for example, sugar cane. And no wonder that Sicily is so big in the production of desserts. Here you have Sicilian cannoli, and underneath it, you have the Sicilian cassata. The Sicilian cassata is also dried fruits, another technique introduced by the Arabs. And it has has also this paste that is made with almonds. Almonds were introduced by the Arabs. The Arabs also introduced couscous um, and also rice for the famous arancini or arancine. You know that in Italian language, we have genders. So depending whether you are in Palermo or Catania, you will call the rice bowls either arancini or arancine. The rice and the the saffron inside were introduced to our culture by the Arabs. And believe it or not, nowadays, in order to find rice cultivation, you have to go to Northern Italy. But back until the time of the unification of Italy, Sicily had vast plantations of rice. Rice was introduced and changed the food culture of our country. Here you can see a market. Palermo has three main markets, Vuciria, Capo, and Ballaro. All these three markets are the most Arab thing that there is in the city. Uh, the Arabs brought so many things. They brought methods of irrigation. They brought new agricultural methods. And all of this together revitalized uh, the, uh, the economy of Sicily. And one of the things they did in Arab Sicily, spaghetti were born. Now I know that out there, someone is gonna tell me, oh, come on, spaghetti were uh, introduced to the world by uh, the Chinese. And it was Marco Polo from Venice who actually took them to the Western world. Sure, 
but in reality, that story was made up in recent times. You know how it works. It is just like the ancient mythology. Sometimes legends take over reality and a very good story happens to be the standard story that is told. In reality, a type of pasta, long and fine in shape, good to be dried, was produced in the small town of Trabia, very close to Palermo. And it was uh, under the Arabs. And this type of pasta was perfect to be preserved and to be, to be shipped elsewhere. So it became another commercial plus of Sicily. It went all the way to Genoa. It went all the way to Tuscany, to Bologna, and finally to, to Naples. And now imagine, nowadays, if you ask a Neapolitan about the origin of spaghetti, they will probably say that they were made in Naples or Pompeii. But in reality, they were made in Trabia at the time of the Arabs. Now, I don't wanna make you too hungry. Therefore, I'm gonna move uh, to another subject that there will be the excuse I have to show you a little bit more sites of this island. I told you at the very beginning, one tour is not enough to show you everything. But Sicily is a great film set. Many movies have been filmed in Sicily. Recently, Indiana Jones. Uh, uh, less, another one was Ocean's 12. But in the old days, we have had some masterpieces who were filmed in many different Sicilian locations. Here it is one, it's Italian. I like to start with this one because it tells the story of Italy at the time of Risorgimento, which is that moment in the history when Italy was united. So following uh, the invasion of the Piemontese from the north uh, to Sicily and the inclusion of Sicily of what will later become the kingdom of Italy, the foundation of our modern nation. Uh, the movie is called Gatto Pardo and the director was Lucchino Visconti. The movie actually originated from a book, a book that was uh, written in the middle of the 20th century uh, by uh, Tommaso di Lampedusa, and it was an incredible historical fictional book, uh, historical fiction about Sicily. The movie was made in 1963. Here there is the wonderful palazzo that still exists, still private, in Palermo, called Val Guarnera Gangi. The reason why it has two names is because it first belonged to the Prince of Walgarnera and then to the Prince Ganji. Uh, and this is the ballroom, the ballroom of the movie where the main actress was Claudia Cardinale, a very young Claudia Cardinale, I have to say. She struck the world for her incredible beauty. And this is the facade of the palace still in the very heart of the city of Palermo. And then we have The Godfather. This is not an Italian movie, but it's definitely uh, a very cinematic movie, something that changed uh, the history of cinema. 1972, the very first one, the very first Godfather. Coppola came to Italy. He wanted to narrate uh, the story of mafia and especially of the Corleonese clan, those that clan that uh, originated from the town of Corleone. But when he went to Corleone, he didn't really like uh, uh, the uh, location. Uh, he didn't think that was the perfect location for what he had in mind. So he traveled extensively to, through Sicily and he discovered other locations. Let's see some of them together. Here is the famous opera house, uh, Teatro Massimo, one of the most beautiful in Italy uh, it, 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 and one of the most important in Europe. And it is on the steps of this opera house uh, that the daughter is actually assassinated. I'm gonna show you also the inside of the opera house because I took this picture last September. You know, nowadays uh, that the locations are very empty, it is such a gift to be able to take pictures. This is uh, a glimpse of the roof. Now it is very beautiful, but it's also a mechanical miracle because you see this uh, heart-shaped, this uh, flower-shaped roof, you see the petals. In reality, those petals uh, can be lifted in order to ensure 
air circulation inside the theater. Tell me if that is not a mechanical miracle that they thought of when they built this incredible uh, theater. The other location of the Godfather is in reality very far away from, from Corleone, back to the eastern side of Sicily, back in the, shade, in the shadow of Mount Etna, not far from Taormina, in the, still in the province of Messina, the little town of Savoca. That's where the famous Bar Vitelli, which is very often seen in the movie, is still nowadays located, left untouched, it looks exactly the way it looked back in those days where they were filming. Here you can see the entrance. People come here in the summertime for a granita. And in front of Barbitelli, you see the monument erected in town to Coppola. Because uh, in this town, life changed with the arrival of this movie. This was a tiny village, which is very remote. The road to get to it is kind of difficult, um, very tiny tiny road, uh, mountains, uh, lots of climbing, uh, and a lot of people had left this place. Now life is back in this place because there is a whole economy that was created by the arrival of tourism. Inside Barbitelli, you can see original pictures of the days when the movie was being filmed. Look at the second one down below. This is the famous marriage scene. And I'm actually going to show you the church that is in Savoca, where that marriage was filmed. And now I'm going to talk about a TV show, a TV show that is becoming insanely famous, uh, especially here in Europe. Uh, imagine that it is uh, it is actually broadcasted uh, in UK and it's one of the most uh, watched shows, uh, but it's also uh, in America. Uh, it's translated Detective Montalbano. Uh, in Italian, we say Commissario Montalbano. The main actor is Luca Zingaretti, who you see in the picture, and it is based on the mysteries by Andrea Camilleri, who recently died uh, a couple of years ago, who has been an incredible TV author and writer in this country. The Adventures of Montalbano started in 1999, and the very last episode that was shown on Italian TV goes back to March of 2021, and we are up to episode 37. And it is said that Andrea Camilleri had actually secured a finale for the Montalbano saga. And this finale has been given to his editor and it's in a safe. So no one knows how this will actually end. I always say if it will ever end. Now, Montalbano gave the world another piece of Sicily that is lesser known. A part of Sicily in the south, southeast, that is the province of Ragusa. Here we see a scene of the movie and we see the beautiful landscape in the background. This is the landscape that you see very often in the episodes of Montalbano. The city is Ragusa and the upper part and the older part of Ragusa is called Ibla. This is one of the most beautiful places in Sicily and it's actually almost uh, a shame that it was left so undiscovered uh, by international tourism for such a long time. Uh, Ibla gives you really a sense uh, of uh, that old fascinating atmosphere of Sicily. Here we see the house of Montalbano that we see in the movie. It is located on the beach. It is an actual existing place and uh, the beach is called Punta Secca. It's a tiny little place that is famous, uh, became famous uh, because of the presence of the house of uh, Montalbano, of Detective Montalbano. And uh, the police station that you see in the movie is actually not in the town of Vigata, which is what is being told uh, in, the, in the TV show. Vigata does not exist. It's an, imaginary, it's an imaginary location. The police station is located in Shikli, which is a 
another little town in the area of Ragusa. And the famous castle, which is the home of the mafia boss Balduccio Sinagra, who often recurs in the narration of the adventures of Montalbano, is in reality the castle of Donna Fugata, an incredible location where the main actor, Zingaretti, actually got married because at this point his life is completely uh, tied to the life uh, of Detective Montalbano. And with this splendid location, I am going to thank you and I'm ending the tour here knowing that I left a lot behind and knowing that there will be other opportunities to show you other areas of this beautiful island. So I want to say to you, Grazie, thank you so very much, Linda. What a wonderful look at Sicily. I, I honestly cannot wait to get there myself and hopefully with all good things that happen in the world, we can get there in September as planned. I'm, I'm hoping that everything um, is opened up by that time and I think it will be. I know that, um, I I know that so. all the regions are looking to travel regardless with, with stronger um, protocols on, on um, COVID protection. So I look forward to it. Um, I am just putting up a slide for people to understand um, that you can tip um, and the tips will go to Linda. Uh, minus the Zoom operating expenses. I do want to make a note. I've heard from a couple of our viewers that there's been some delay with Venmo. Apparently, there is some internet outages with some of the largest e-commerce machines that are out there. So if you are not able to get something through now, just make a note and do it a little bit later or tomorrow morning or whenever it's worth it for you. But check if it gets held up. Um, come back to it. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Linda. You always, bring, you know, everybody is like, what is your, what is your background? Are you a historian? You bring such rich, deep knowledge of your location. So we really, truly appreciate it. You are so articulate. You are clear. You're concise. So it's, it's really a pleasure. Um, you gave us a full view, not only the historic perspective, but the cuisine, the culture, and even the media, you know, the, I now have a new show I have to binge watch. So I have to find out um, where and what, what, network that shows on in the US so that I can put it on my on my list. Um, so I put up a slide for everybody to know where you can tip. I also just am highlighting on the right what physical tours I have coming up in the near future. If you're interested in traveling with our group on a physical tour, please reach out to me. Um, it would be fun to see some of you face to face and to get to know you as well um, in addition to our virtual experiences. I also do want to thank people. You know, this is a this has been a little strange in the last week or two. I started to get um, some tips for me. Um, I will just tell you that I will use all of those tips for the operating expenses. Um, I appreciate you appreciating what I do here for you, and I certainly will continue to try to bring you as many virtual tours as possible. But um, anything that you send over my way will go to the operating expenses so that we can continue to do this and serve you all with more virtual tours. Having said that, I'm going to give Linda a breath of air and then we're gonna dive into the questions. We have a lot of great questions here. Um, the first one I'd like you to address only because it's one of the, the questions that comes up on every virtual tour. And I am also very interested in this is, if we were to do this tour in real life, how long would we have to leave to do it? And what time of year would be best to do it? So if you could start with those two questions and then we'll dive into the other questions, that would be great. I would say that the tour that I have just uh, presented, um, considering the many locations, uh, a good 12 days uh, is probably the time you need uh, uh, to see these places. Um, and that will give you a general overview. Now, these places have a lot to, to, to be discovered. So obviously you could stay for a month uh, and you won't get bored about Sicily because it's such an incredible location. The time of the year, Sicily is one of those locations that has an amazing weather all year round. But it is true that during the winter is uh, all less crowded, but also less Less things are available. So I would say from spring until the end of October, good to go. 
Okay, I'm going to let you, unless you'd like me to read them off, I'm going to let you attack the questions yourself. If you prefer to have the back and forth and the dialogue, I can certainly serve them up to you. You tell okay, me. Okay, I have a tiny screen, so I might have some uh, troubles uh, operating. You'll see your screen. eyes very big as you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I plan to go to Sicily last year and I'm thinking of trying again next year. What is the highlight in Giardini Naxos, the beach? That definitely, that would be my, my first suggestion. The highlight is the beach and is being able to go to Taormina very easily. There are public buses that go back and forth. So definitely Giardini Naxos is a valid alternative to the more expensive hotels of Taormina. Were uh, people living there when the Greeks uh, arrived? Well, yes, there were some uh, indigenous populations in Sicily, uh, and most probably the name of Sicily derives from the uh, from the uh, early tribes uh, indigenous to the island. But the Greek domination actually started what is called the Sicilian civilization. If you read ancient literature, one of the things that they say is that when the barbarians discovered the cultivation of the olive and of the vine, that's when they became civilized. And now to the Greeks, everybody was not Greek, was barbarian, basically. So that is uh, a bit of an explanation of uh, why we start with the Greeks when we, um, when we actually talk about Sicily. Uh, type of weather in October. October is a very mild climate. Uh, although the summers can be brutally hot in Sicily, the climate of October is actually very mild. It's not yet very rainy. November is the season when we have the most rain, although not every November has been the same. This year has been a bit tragic with the rain in Sicily, but it has been an unusual situation. Was the temple practicing Muslim in those times? Uh, uh, okay, wait a sec. I don't, I don't understand clearly. I don't really understand this question completely, but I have to say that uh, probably you want to ask uh, if uh, the Muslim religion, the Islamic religion was, uh, was practiced in those days. Yes, all the temples, those Christian churches that were transformed into mosques is because of uh, the practicing of the religion of that population. Uh, we saw Trojan women there. I'm not sure what you mean. Has there been any effort to restore maybe just by computer the cathedral and the temple of Syracuse? Yes, there have been a lot of attempts by archeologists uh, to show this 3D reconstructions uh, of uh, how the temple must have looked like. And now these reconstructions, uh, they are based uh, on historical sources. Uh, so they're really accurate. Uh, we know that we don't have a picture from the past, uh, but the historical sources can tell us a lot, descriptions, coins, uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, resources. Uh, does sea salt have different properties than regular salt other than the lack of iodine? Uh, in reality, I heard that it's uh, supposedly a, a little healthier, but uh, don't take my words too seriously because I don't know much about the properties of salt. All I've been taught in life is that you should stay away from salt as much as possible. Um, and I know that uh, sea salt has this lack of iodine that is, uh, um, that is uh, compensated with uh, uh, the addition of it. Uh, would you recommend Sicily for a honeymoon or it's more of a busy travel destination? Thinking of it, uh, no, it's not, uh, it's busy, but not, busy as you think of, like uh, floods of people all in the same place. Uh, no, and it's a perfect location for a honeymoon, honestly. Have the mosaics been touched up to restore the colors? I'm telling you something. The mosaics of Piazza Merina have been damaged by us. In the attempt of preserving them with those roofs, uh, um, in reality, what we have done, we have damaged uh, um, the mosaics because we have created inside a greenhouse effect. And this greenhouse effect has lifted some of the tiles and faded some of the colors. Uh, the restoration is just preservation, it's never gonna be reconstruction. So what is lost is lost forever. 
is the Palatine Chapel called Moreale? No, two different things. Uh, Moreale is uh, the cathedral outside of Palermo, the Duomo di Moreale, and the Palatine Chapel is the royal chapel inside the Norman Palace, which is the royal palace uh, of Palermo. Can you suggest a good history of Sicily? Hmm. I, well, in reality, if you're talking about a book, uh, the real way of understanding the history of Sicily is to buy a book about European history. And uh, there you're going to go through the different dominations uh, and Sicily recurs very often into the main histo history manuals. Uh, I went to Sicily about 10 years ago. It's good to see the highlights again. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. In the older times, uh, did Sicily have an old name? Yes, in reality, the, the old name of Sicily derives uh, from, uh, um, from the indigenous populations uh, that populated the island, uh, like the, Sikin, the Sikils and the Sicani. Sadly, no countryside scenes are shown. Is there nothing there to see? No, in reality, there is a lot to see. There is a lot to see. I had to make a choice. <laughs> I had to choose uh, and I opted for the great locations, uh, uh, man-made locations. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, the, the countryside of Sicily is superb. For example, one of the things that I suggest everyone, uh, if, you, if you go and if you take a trip to Mount Etna, don't simply go on the top of the mountain to see uh, uh, the volcanic uh, landscape, but also take a chance to go in the lower part uh, on the slopes where the vineyards are planted. Because the wine industry of Sicily, of Etna, is one of the most important in Italy. It has been neglected for so many years, for decades, but what they do on the slopes of Mount Etna is incredible, also in terms of technology. So definitely take a chance. And there you will, you will see some very lush vegetation, among other places, of course. Uh, I'm leading a flotilla of eight sailboats in September. Could you talk brief, briefly about the Aeolian Islands? Uh, the Aeolian Islands, talk briefly, it's almost impossible. Because the Aeolian Islands is something, is an adventure on its own. Uh, each one of those islands has a very distinctive flavor. They are a wine paradise. They are amazing volcanic scenery. Uh, they are incredible hiking adventures and amazing sailing opportunities on the Aeolian Islands. Uh, I can tell you my favorite, I'm crazy enough, my favorite is Stromboli, although it erupts every 15, 20 minutes. I do love Stromboli. The scenery of Stromboli is like, for me, it's mesmerizing. It's fantastic. And I even took the hike all the way to the very top, the one that you have to stay overnight that feels like very dangerous, but it was my lifetime experience. So it's something that I recommend uh, to everyone. It's a real, it's a true volcanic, uh, 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 adventure. What was the name of the theater? We saw two theaters. We saw the theater of the ancient theater of Taormina. We saw, no, we saw three theaters. The ancient theater of Taormina, the ancient theater of Siracusa, and we saw the opera house of Palermo called Teatro Massimo. I'm reading the uh, uh, ha a house in Sicily. Could you speak about Casa Cuseni? I haven't read a house in Sicily, so I'm afraid uh, I I'm, no. That is uh, is out of my uh, field of knowledge. Have uh, rising sea levels affected the coast of Sicily as the rest of uh, southern Italy? Yes. Yes, uh, global warming is hitting Italy really bad. Um, some regions more than others. Uh, I would definitely say that probably Calabria is more affected than Sicily is. But Sicily is in many, uh, in many ways and in many different areas. Uh, from which of the historical influences come the puppet theater tradition, i pupi? Ah, the puppets, uh, those who should have been included. But once again, it would have been a, a whole new thing to do. Um, they come from uh, uh, the Norman, the Arab Norman time. Um, the puppets, uh, that is a, a true cultural. Um, a, a, it's a whole new culture that uh, would take some time to describe, actually. If you're interested, though, in learning about the puppets, uh, when you go to Palermo, and if you go to Palermo, you have to go 
uh, to the theater of the puppets uh, so that you can actually uh, learn more about this uh, old, this ancient art of uh, the Sicilians. Um, you have, uh, Re Rebecca has only been to the Eastern side. That's a shame because I think the Western side of Sicily is, uh, an amazing opportunity to really complete uh, your overview about Sicily. What do I like about the Western side? For me, the Western side, for me, Palermo is like a royal city. It's a city where I really get the sense of cosmopolitan culture that Sicily has shared with the world. You only get there and you realize what I'm talking about because this sense of uh, um, tolerance and of cohabitation of different cultures uh, only happens in Palermo. It is the best example I can think of. Um, Ragusa area is amazing. Ragusa area is very neglected by mass tourism. Um, it is in reality a good thing uh, because uh, the, the fact that it was neglected by mass tourism has preserved it uh, well. It is an area that is so full of surprises. You know, sometimes when I speak, especially to um, some Italians, uh, they tell me, oh yes, it's all about Baroque and it's pretty much the same architecture throughout. Uh, the reason why I like the, um, the, um, the, the area of Ragusa is because uh, it's the culture that intrigues me. It's uh, the cultural feature of that province uh, that I find extremely interesting and intriguing. It's the traditions of that area that seems, seem to me uh, like more authentic. Um, definitely a place to visit. If you only had a week, would you recommend the East or the West? Oh my God, if I only had a week. You know that in a week you can do actually the East and the West, maybe not going so much in depth, uh, but I have done in the past, like landing in, landing in Palermo, going to Agrigento, moving to Piazza Armerina and finishing up in Taormina. Uh, maybe it's kind of hard to include Syracuse, so you could give it a try. Of course, you will not be able to stay long in each one of these places. Uh, but uh, yes, definitely, it's something that you could try. Would you need a rental car to do a comprehensive tour of Sicily? If not, how would you travel around the island? I'm going to tell you this. This is a very interesting question. One of the things uh, about Sicily is that the road system is not perfect and uh, the train system is very outdated. Uh, there is a system of bus transportation between main cities, uh, but yes, definitely, if you're traveling on your own, rent a car. That is uh, the, best, the, the best thing you can do. Uh, what happened to the Jews of Palermo? Well, in reality, I didn't touch too much onto the Jewish uh, uh, culture, sorry, onto the Jewish culture of Sicily, because that is, once again, it's a, a whole new chapter, and it's not simply the Jewish of, the Jews of Palermo. The Jewish culture of Sicily is extremely complex, uh, and it travels throughout the island, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not an easy answer I can give right now. Uh, I mean, just to summarizing in a couple of words. Uh, um, yeah, definitely. If you want to know more, I can. You can email me, for example. I can suggest you some reading, and uh, that will give you a better insight. Uh, would you need? A, uh, okay, no. If you would you be able to suggest resources for obtaining documentation like birth and marriage certificates of Sicilian ancestors in order to apply for an Italian passport? Uh, if you do have the correct documentation that you already obtained back home, you can get in touch with the municipality of, uh, uh, of the town where your ancestors were from. Normally there is an office, I'm typing this, that is called, called Anagrafe. And the Anagrafe is a place where they can give you the information you're looking for. Uh, so, that, that is something you could try. Otherwise, the best is, uh, um, is uh, 
uh, is to go to Ellis Island. Ellis Island has an incredible amount of resources uh, for tracing heritage back, so to obtain the right documentation for the uh, for the request of citizenship. I know many people have actually done it, and they started by saying that it was a bit of a nightmare in the beginning, and then it turned out to be absolutely doable. So give it a try, definitely. Mara, I am. I seem unable to be to go over this. Uh, oh yes, okay. Yes, my chat was frozen for a minute. Can I recommend getting the train to Sicily from Rome or Naples? The train goes on the ship and is the last train ship journey in Europe. Depending on your carriage, you then go to Palermo or Syracuse. A unique trip. I'm gonna try to explain this. It's a unique, very long trip. And the trains are not the high speed trains, uh, but it's a unique adventure. I've done it many times, I have to say. You stay on the train for endless hours. Uh, what happens is that uh, basically you have to get on the right coach and the right car because uh, the train splits when it arrives in, uh, in, um, in Sicily and one part of it goes to one location and the other one goes to another location. So God forbids you are in the wrong place. Uh, you might end up uh, to the wrong destination, but it's amazing. You don't really get to understand the maneuvering if you're inside a train of get, be, gain, getting loaded on the ferry, but it's just amazing to think of uh, the fact that you are taking a very short ferry ride with a whole train on a ferry. Um, because of tourism, are the streets uh, uh, fairs ebbly congested? No, 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 absolutely no. I wouldn't say that. How far is Tuscany from Sicily? Far. <laughs> Rome is already quite far. Uh, Tuscany is far. Uh, Sicily is very well connected with planes. Uh, so from all major airports, you actually have uh, um, very cheap rates uh, to get to Sicily. We have two main airports, uh, Palermo and Catania. Actually, Catania is the third largest airport of Italy the third most important strategic airport of Italy. So you can understand that there are a number of airlines that actually go there. Are there restaurants you would recommend? A million of them, it depends where. Uh, you gotta email me from that. You tell me where you wanna go and I'm gonna give you my, my top 10 uh, uh, list of restaurants. Uh, uh, I am, uh, I'm a bit of a foodie myself uh, and uh, I always investigate the food traditions of every place where I go to. So yes, I do have plenty of them, but it depends where. My daughter and son-in-law did a walking tour of Sicilian countryside and they loved it. Uh, there are quite widely traveled and they say that the Sicilian wines are the best they have ever tasted. And I do agree with that. And curiosity, the Sicilians are also extremely good at uh, uh, wine making with a natural method, which does not mean organic, but it means natural. It means uh, that uh, you're using less uh, artificial products uh, in the winemaking process uh, and uh, you know in order to obtain a good product with uh, natural methods you need elevation so the the the, the um, wines of Etna are some of the finest in Italy have you been to the Vindicari nature preserve and it is worth a special trip yes Totally, totally. Vendicari is a masterpiece of mother nature, a natural reserve where you can go to the beach. It's fantastic. You should go, definitely. If you're thinking of it, you're already there. Just um, make your reservation. Is the origin of the song Funiculi Funicula really about the construction of the tram up to Etna? No, up to Mount Vesuvius, Naples. It doesn't have anything to do with Mount Etna. There is not a tram, a trolley that goes on Mount Etna. There is none of Mount Vesuvius these days because Mount, the, the funicular, that was the name of that train, was destroyed in the eruption of 1944. But Funiculi Funicula was the song that was composed when the, uh, this particular transportation was inaugurated and it's related to the Bay of Naples, Mount Vesuvius. What's the political situation there? In Sicily, the same of Italy. Uh, Sicily, I know that many people say Sicily and Italy, but Sicily is not independent. Sicily is one of the 20 Italian regions that enjoys a certain degree of autonomy, of semi-independence, uh, together with other regions that have the same, uh, um, the same status, but uh, it is absolutely uh, one of the 20 Italian regions. So it's the same uh, situation that we all experience. Uh, um, 
politics is a bit of a mess everywhere. So also here we have our share of problems. I recommend a tour and not a car in Sicily, more information, less stress, I do too, but uh, it seems that I have to, right? So, so that I can give a tour, I can continue giving tours. But yes, a tour is definitely a more comprehensive uh, um, uh, experience. And the person who wrote that message, I saw that the last name was Rizzo, like my family. Uh, yes, Rizzo is one Sicilian last name. I don't know where your family was from, but mine were from Fiume Freddo, which is one of the locations where The Godfather was actually uh, filmed. Wondering where they got gold and what did they use to make the gold? They used gold and uh, it was definitely, we have no gold mines in Sicily. It was actually acquired. It is re real gold. Just to follow up, can you give me the old name? of Sicily in the old times. Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by this. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to uh, Trinacria that was, I was talking about before. So maybe you wanna give me uh, more details. Would you include your email for us to follow up with you and further recommendations? Yes, I did. Uh, I'm gonna, I can, uh, um, I can actually type it. I, I wrote at the end of the slide. So if you re-see the end of the video, you will see it, but I'm typing it again here. Okay, done. Uh, you're a foodie, then maybe a foodie tour one day. I would love to take a culinary stay in Sicily and suggestions like on farm and with a family restaurant, Rene. Rene. In Sicily, you have some of the most amazing food experiences. Uh, I can tell you from wineries uh, to a, a place, for example, where they only grow aromatic herbs uh, or uh, a beautiful farm that is run by a contessa where she has these ladies that prepare, craft everything by hand. Uh, you have farms with animals, so all kinds of experiences that you can think of. Uh, please repeat and spell the name of the natural preserve you mentioned. Uh, I am typing it, uh, Vendicari. I typed it in the capital letters, sorry. We went to the church in Forza d'Agro, my grandparents' hometown, which claimed to be the location of Godfather wedding scene. What town did you say wedding scene was filmed? Yes, there was the Forza d'Agro is another one of the two locations of the um, of the Godfather movie, and it is located near Savoca, the, the town I was talking about. My maternal great grandparents' last name was Taormina, but they lived in, in Marineo, at least prior to coming to the United States. Someday I would love to visit Sicily and see these places in person. I, you should, you should. Taormina is actually a very, uh, very common name. I don't know, but this is my question to you. You might have some Jewish uh, uh, origin uh, because generally when you have uh, the name, the last name of a place here in Italy, we, uh, we consider that as uh, um, a sign of uh, Jew Jewish heritage. I have the same in my family. So I was told this a long time ago by experts uh, in this field. Do you have a recommendation of a recipe book for authentic Sicilian cuisine? Can I suggest you something? There is a website online that is called La Cucina Italiana, and I know that they produce material in English. And uh, um, this website is actually a magazine, and they do have uh, a very good uh, way of explaining their recipes without changing them, keeping them authentic, uh, which is an important thing. Um, where is the best olive oil? Ah, gosh. The best olive oil is hard to tell you because there are there is variety in Sicily. I like uh, I personally like uh, a producer from where I buy, which is located uh, near in the in the little town of Avola, A V O L A. Uh, but also the area of Trapani is extremely fine. Um, and, uh, you know, the Sicilians are also, a lot of the olive oil production is a matter of fine blending. So when they blend in 
uh, all these uh, different types of olives, cultivars, they call them. Uh, they, the result, the final result is amazing. Those of you. Uh, yes, I never heard of the last name Bivetto, so I will have to agree with Rosemary. It is a first time for me too. Uh, but you know, some last names have disappeared, uh, so that um, that doesn't mean anything. But I never heard of it. What was the name of this year that was uh, has the petals? Uh, Teatro Massimo. I'm gonna write it down. There you go. Did you say your family is, no, I didn't say that. My family is from, uh, I have uh, family members from Fiume Freddo. I am, uh, I am actually, I actually uh, typed it. Uh, Fiume Freddo is a tiny village. In reality, when you see some of the scenes of the Godfather, if you look at the sidewalk, uh, you see that it's paved with lava stone. Those scenes were filmed in Fiume Freddo. Fiume Freddo is a tiny, town uh, at the on the slopes of Mount Etna and uh, it's called Fiume Freddo which is a uh, cold river there is a beach nearby where a stream of cold water comes down from the volcano and it's extremely cold so imagine you're standing on the beach for hours and hours in the steaming hot Sicilian summers and when you had enough or you're too sweat you just go and you dip into the cold river it's an amazing experience can you say a few words about Erice? Eh. Erice is uh, an architectural masterpiece. Uh, it is perched above the city of Trapani, from where you can enjoy this amazing view of the area, of the salt pans, of the Egadi Island, of the city of Trapani. It is, a, it is a, the town of science, because there one of our most famous scientists uh, has, uh, um, has founded a research center where symposiums of scientists uh, are actually Actually, um, are actually held every year. And uh, uh, you want to see more about Erice? There is an Italian movie that I think has been subtitled in English that is called uh, In Guerra per Amore, At War for Love. And the film director is Pif, P-I-F. He made also an excellent movie about mafia, very funny, which is called uh, Mafia Only Kills in the Summer which from the title you understand uh, is uh, very ironic too. And uh, um, in reality, if you, if you watch the movie uh, At War for Love, you will see Erice at the time of the Second World War. And it's not much different than today. They have just uh, added some of, uh, you know, the typical advertisement of the fascist period, but uh, it is, um, it is, um, it's actually, um, it's it's a good a good introduction. Okay, I think that is everything. We have taken all of it except for all of the thank yous that I um, did not allow you to read. But I don't know I will, how many I missed, Mara. I'll but, sum uh, them up for you. There were four million um, thank yous, and you did a great job. So everybody is looking for the food tour next. So we'll have to come back at them for uh, for a food tour. Um, but thank you, you are, again. Yeah, and those who are interested in knowing more about uh, Jewish Sicily or yeah. specific, uh, please email me. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anybody who needs to reach Linda and does not um, have her direct contact, by all means, send me a text, a chat, a PM or whatever you need. And I will, by all means, um, connect the two of you or I'll at least get the answers and send them back to you. So Linda, thank you again uh, for giving us two hours of your time. We truly appreciate it. And thank you everybody who joins us. We really appreciate you hanging on and going through the q and I always love the q and I think it's one of the most favorite times for me because not only do you get the history and the background of the destination, but you get the sense of the tour director and her personality as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. So I'm gonna say thank you and good night or good day, wherever you are, and we'll see you all next week. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye, thank you very much.